Well, hello and welcome again, everybody, to another OpenShift Commons briefing. We're really pleased today to have folks from the Kubert project um, here to give us uh, an overview and to talk about um, what you can do with it on Kubernetes. And um, from Red Hat, we have Itmar Heim and Fabian Deutsch. And I'm going to let them talk for about probably half an hour, do a little bit of a demo, um, and we'll have live Q&A at the end. If you have questions, ask them in the chat. We'll try and answer them. We'll read out the questions at the end so that everybody who is listening to the recording afterwards can hear um, the questions. And we'll have some live Q&A as well. So without any further ado, Itmar, um, let's let's take it away and get started. Thank you, Diane. So hi, everyone. I'm Itamar Haim. I run the engineering groups for System Virtualization and Container Management in Red Hat. And Fabian Deutsch, who is presenting with me, is leading the uh, engineering effort around Kubert. So what is Kubert? It's an upstream research project where we're looking at can we use Kubernetes for converged infrastructure? And when we're saying converged infrastructure, we're talking about containers and virtual machines. Now, this is really early days, but there are some interesting concepts that we thought worth sharing because we're looking at interesting aspects of how Kubernetes is doing things and leveraging different mechanism in Kubernetes uh, that are pretty advanced around extensibility and trying to map different concepts from the experience that we have from you know, scheduling other workloads like virtual machines on cluster to the Kubernetes world. So we thought it's, you know, while it's still research, it's interesting to share and hopefully you'll do the same. So just as a background, uh, when we're talking about virtualization in, uh, in the Linux world, we're obviously talking about KVM and the Nice thing about KVM was that it made a virtual machine just a user process. So we just get QM and KVM running as a user process. Now, just having one, you know, virtual machine, the fact is user process not good enough uh, to, to as a solution, as a technical solution, but not a full blown solution. And this is where a project like Overt came along to focus on. I want to run a group of virtual machines on a cluster of hosts with shared storage and you know, full-blown uh, management user interface to orchestrate host life cycle, virtual machine life cycle, live migration, load balancing, concepts like that. So an enterprise could you know, do data center virtualization with KVM. Then OpenStack came along and tackled infrastructure as a service. So more, how do I provide APIs to virtualize not only the virtual machine, but also my storage, my network, and other services. But both Overt and OpenStack focused on virtual machines as the core entity. OpenStack is looking at other things as well, but virtual machines were really the, the start and the core of this. And then came containers and Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes is dealing in a similar area of, I want to schedule workloads containers on resources clustered resources, hosts, storage, network. And the nice thing about Kubernetes with containers, it's a bit more of a generic use case than virtual machine was. So the question was, can we take this generic use case that Kubernetes handles and look at virtual machines as well? Because, hey, virtual machines are just a user process. We can maybe put them in containers, for example. And virtual machines already share some uh, concept that containers use. Containers use SC Linux and C groups for isolation. They also use namespaces, which is not relevant for virtual machines, but really same concept. So can we look at this and get to a converged infrastructure we put on Kubernetes, virtual machine, and containers just together? Now, why would you want to do this? So yes, containers are cool. Containers are all the rage. Kubernetes is great. And with things like OpenShift, it actually changes more than just scheduling workloads, actually changing your DevOps, your development lifecycle, how you approach even software, uh, CI. It's, it's a broader solution than what virtualization on its own went to solve. But with that, there's a huge investment in virtual machines. They're just not going away anytime soon. Just like on-premise versus cloud isn't going away anytime soon. So if you think about it, we still have mainframes with us because the investment is so large, the virtualization market is still growing. So if you invest in containers in five or 10 years from now, would you want to have multiple silo deployments or would you like to have a single infrastructure that you can put all of your workloads on it and 
think about how advanced it will get to be at that point and how easier it will be to maintain and operate and obviously reduce costs if you can do it on a single infrastructure. Another aspect is as you evolve your applications that used to run in virtual machines, you want to start moving them to containers. So you have the database and the front end portion of your application. So maybe you start with the front end and you move it to containers. If you can move it to containers and it still runs on the same host and you get the local affinity that the container is calling the database, but it's on the same host, so no network latency, you know, everything is simpler to manage and control this way. So that's another benefit. Uh, as you migrate, you don't need to plan for different hardware footprints because you're now migrating workloads from the virtual one to the containerized one. The workload can stay on the same host. Now for virtual machines, we can benefit from some advanced concept that Kubernetes has. So virtualization is very mature and has a lot of things that Kubernetes still is still catching up with, but Kubernetes is first of all, moving very fast and also bring some you know, newer concepts. So if we look at daemon sets, oh, that's a nice feature. We could get it out of the box in Kubernetes and get it for virtual machines suddenly. Uh, rolling upgrades, things like that are things that we could leverage there as well. The benefit to Kubernetes is that there's tons of experience on the virtualization side and tackling similar aspects that the one Kubernetes is tackling, especially when you're looking at on-premise and bare metal use cases. So things like host lifecycle, things like device pass-through, for all of those, there's tons of experience. And this is why we think this is going to be a win-win if we can look at converging those solutions into one. Now, when you're saying virtualization and containers and Kubernetes, sometimes there's confusion in what is the use case you're talking about. So I want to separate between two use cases. One use case is I care about containers. I want to run containers. I want to run them in Kubernetes, but I am still not as certain that containers give me the level of isolation between tenants and workloads that virtual machines give me. So I want to run my container inside a VM just to use the VM as to isolate. And that's something a project like Clear Containers is trying to tackle and on um, providing better isolation for virtual machines. Now, Hubert, by looking at virtual machines, can also lend you know, a solution to that problem, but that's not the focus. The focus is we want to run full-fledged VMs and leverage Kubernetes to do this. So it's not about the isolation story you might have heard of. It's we have VMs, same VMs we have in over it and OpenStack, et cetera, and we want to take them and run them on Kubernetes with all of their features. So I care about running a VM as the use case. I'm a VM admin. This is the Overt dashboard, and the, the, it's not about running Kubernetes with Overt, things like that, although we just published reference architecture on running OpenShift on top of virtualization, but that is today when you use virtualized infrastructure to solve gaps that Kubernetes doesn't deal with on host lifecycle. Hopefully in the future, we can look at a single infrastructure. We're using over here just to showcase features from virtualization and some of our thinking process. So virtualization, same, same concept, shared set of node, storage and network, and we want to run workloads on them, in this case, virtual machines. Now, some aspects are similar between virtual machines and containers or pods, and some are different. So we're trying to map them and try to look at those that make sense for containers. Let's focus on enhancing Kubernetes to close those gaps. Those that do not make sense, there's no point bloating Kubernetes to do everything in the world, rather relying on the extensibility of Kubernetes and separate the aspects that are not core to Kubernetes and just solving them for VMs. And Fabian will later showcase in more detail the thing here around there. So things like uh, memory sharing might be relevant to containers because if you're running containers, those are technologies we invented for virtual machines but are relevant for containers as well. KSM will scan processes. If they have similar memory pages, it will merge them to conserve space. 
Memory ballooning is a technology more specific to virtual machines, probably not relevant to containers and Kubernetes. So, oh, this one, probably not relevant. Memory overloading, scheduling, all those aspects are relevant. And when you're looking about at scheduling, so Kubernetes has scheduling, uh, pluggable scheduler, and you can extend it. It's not at the maturity that OpenStack is where 80 different scheduler were implemented for different use cases but it has the potential and the capabilities, it just need to, you know, to be in the field more in those different use cases. Another aspect we're looking to solve, for example, when you're talking about running your own uh, host is you want to conserve power. So in virtualization world, you'll try to consolidate the workload, say overnight by live migrating uh, workloads into fewer hosts and shutting down the other host. That is a concept that could be relevant to the container world as well. It's not all about just scheduling resources, workloads on hosts. A lot of the issues you deal with is actually error handling. And this is where things like fencing comes along. I no longer see a node that had pods running on it. Can, does that mean the node is down or no? I can somehow detect it's still running despite not having a network ping to it, maybe through a storage mechanism or something else. Before I fence it, is do I don't see the node or I don't see a lot of nodes, maybe the problem is on my side. Now, why do I want to fence a node? Is because I want to make sure before I start that pod, that workload again on another host, that it's not going to corrupt my persistent volume if it's to Postgres databases. So some storage support exclusive access, some don't. If we're talking about leveraging existing storage technologies, for example, investment in them, it's something we'd like to solve. There are different fencing aspects. And you start by soft fencing, trying to SSH and restart the kubelet maybe before you shut down the entire host, then go to IPMI, then go to the actual power interfaces to turn off the power of that host. Maybe you want to check if the host is k-dumping. If it has a terabyte or two terabyte of RAM, that's going to take time. And you want that dump for troubleshooting. So you want to detect it's dumping. You now know the workload is no longer running because it's dumping, but you don't want to turn the power off yet. Now, those concepts might sound strange to you if you're focused on Kubernetes running on existing infrastructure, virtualized or cloud. But if we're looking at converged infrastructure, we will want Kubernetes to be to have concepts like this or augment it with solution managing the, the environment to give us those features that we get today for free from Kubernetes so we could get to a single environment. Another aspect is network management. Today, Kubernetes networking is so it's sophisticated on the multi-tenancy, but not on the physical layers. Maybe you have different physical networks and you want to map different networks. So that's an, an aspect of host life cycle and network management that we would like to look at. And then we get to the, you know, the actual virtual machine. So if you look at CPUs and memory, okay, that maps one to one, and, but we don't need to look in Kubernetes at things like Spice, remote audio, video uh, that we do for virtual machines because you know, the concept is not as relevant for containers. So there's no need to look at that. And our goal, again, is not to push everything into Kubernetes, rather we're looking at what would make sense and where would each piece make sense. And this is where some things are relevant. We're starting, they weren't in the beginning, but hey, Newman CPU pinning are now in Kubernetes. Live migration exists in virtual machines for years, being talked about from containers may or may not be relevant at some point, but hey, maybe we could look at those policies and do something about with the experience we're bringing from virtualization. So that is just to give concepts of why we're looking at this and what we're trying to accomplish. And now Fabian will deep dive a bit more into what we're looking at. Yes, so hello first, and let me try to share my screen. I hope that everybody can see my screen now. Yep, looks good. Very good. So let me pick up, pick up where Itamar stopped. So Itamar showed us 
what we want to deliver on top of Kubernetes. And um, with those requirements, we looked at, so what are our goals? What do we want to deliver? And one of our, I mean, the foremost goal is to deliver a feature complete virtualization API, which allows us to live, deliver all the functionality we have today in its granularity. So with all the details, with, with spice displays and with NUMA pinning. Um, and to do this in a way which doesn't contradict with, with containers or Kubernetes itself. By the way, Kubert is aiming to deliver an API. So it's not about writing a fancy UI. It's rather to, to provide the functionality on the cluster level, the virtualization functionality on a cluster level. Besides that, we also want to play nice with Kubernetes. So we want to be well behaving in the community. We want to do that technically and community wise. Uh, technically means that we want to avoid hacks and rather see that we extend Kubernetes in a way in which it is intended. And then we obviously strive for production stable or stability on all levels. So that means we really need the production readiness on the low levels. So where the VM is really run, basically on the bare metal, on the node level, but also up to the public API so that UIs or automation can be built against our API. All of that should be looking like a native Kubernetes API on the other side to um, give the user a unified experience, regardless if he's working with containers or pods. To achieve these goals, um, we, we had to understand a few things. So we need to understand what virtualization API do we really need? We'll get to that in a moment, but there are a couple of options of, of where that could lie or how it could look. Uh, then we wanted to understand what, what runtime do we want? There are also several options. Um, should we use Libvirt and KVM, or should we rather drop to QEMU because it also has its benefits and draw, drawbacks? And then another point is how do we finally integrate? I mean, if we know how the API looks and how we want to do the runtime, how do we integrate with Kubernetes? Um, there are also several ways, and we will also take a brief look at them, but that also drove our research. And then in the end, it was really to identify the technical gaps um, between the virtualization functionality we know and have today and what Kubernetes can deliver, especially in the infrastructure area, so storage, networking, scheduling. So prior art. So before we started with Kubert, there were already quite a few projects. Um, without looking at when they emerged, um, here are three I want to speak about. So one is Vertlet. Um, that's a project which is effectively um, a container runtime for Kubernetes, which can run VMs. And the intention of the Vertlet is really to run VMs. I mean, it's not doing it transparently. It's rather providing some mechanisms like pod annotations to, to customize the VM. But on the other hand, it's using the pod API to define the VM. So you take a pod specification and the vertlet is deriving a VM from you and you've got some freedom to, to specify um, certain parts of it, like what kind of bus you want to use for a disk. Then there's run V, uh, which is a different approach. Um, here it's not about running VMs, but rather to run VMs for isolation purpose. So what you have here is you also post a VM spec and if it's run by the run v, v, uh, run v runtime, then a VM will be spawned and that pod, so the containers, are launched within that VM. But the, the fact that the VM is running is hidden from the user in any way and you don't have a way to influence it. The same is true for clear containers. So with OCI CC runtime, there is an um, implementation which you can indirectly use through the um, OCI CRI runtime. And that is also aiming at providing an isolation to pods and not to offer the user the ability to run VMs. So it's also implicit. So far, so good. So um, we've seen that the existing projects offer different APIs to interact or not interact with the VM, at least. And the Vertlet was so far the closest to our approach, but it does not provide the API we need. So what we need, so they were mainly used, so, and, and run VM containers were creating the VMs for isolation. 
Um, and the Vertlet approach has a problem with scale so far. So if we try to put all the details about VMs into annotations in the pod, that is getting messy and unstructured um, and eventually does not even scale. Or we are reinventing a structured um, struct in the headers of a pod file. And that, don't know, that did not look very well. So we said that we wanted to go with a dedicated API for virtualization. Um, we actually have that today. We were based on TPRs, which are now obsoleted by CRDs. And we're actually working on our own user API server for custom resources and sub-resources. Um, because this allows us to define our custom APIs or custom objects or custom kinds and resources related to virtualization. Um, so, so far, for example, we've got um, an API to specify a VM, but we also got an API to, to trigger migrations. Um, and here we go with an example of the current uh, VM API. So, if you look at it from a uh, syntactical point of view, it looks like a pod specification. Um, it also has a header, it has a, has a kind field, it has metadata and a spec a specification. And it can also be written in YAML or JSON, like pod specification. It's just a different object you are specifying. To give you a little bit of insight of how this translates to, to our stack, so part, parts of these um, specification or parts of these definition are used in different parts in Kubernetes. So if you look at the domain section further below where you've got the name and the type, um, this is obviously taken to, to define the right VM on the lower levels. But if you take uh, go a few lines further up, for example, the node selector, that is a field which is taken to, to be passed to Kubernetes to leverage the Kubernetes scheduler to do the appropriate scheduling. And right at the bottom, you also see, or you get a hint, um, that we try to reuse existing API objects in the, of the Kubernetes API. In that example below, it's um, that we are using a persistent volume claim um, as a source or the backing file for, for a disk. So that, is, that was about the API. Um, and you saw that we are using um, libvirt to run this stuff. We handed that one or two times, um, but there's more to it. So libvirt is not run on the node level which is done by the vertlet run VNK containers. So they're not necessarily running um, libvirt, but at least they are run not within pods or containers, but rather alongside the kubelet as a service usually on the host operating system. So what we do is we said we want to containerize our runtime. So first, before we get to that, libvirt, yeah, we, the decision went with libvirt because it is a proven, stable, and feature-rich component which we're also using in, in other virtualization products or components in the open source landscape. And we put Libvirt and QEMU, so all of its dependencies and things necessary to run the VMs into containers. That has benefits. The main benefits are that you can, that the lifecycle of Libvirt and all the dependencies are not tied to the cluster or to the node life cycles. And that gives benefits when we think about releasing and updating strategies. Furthermore, you don't need to have two um, approaches to, on the one hand, manage the cluster or the application within the cluster, so Kubert, and on the other side, make sure that the right dependencies are installed on the hosts. Um, because then you have yeah, two mechanisms, two processes, which you need to take care of to perform one update, which can get complicated. Technically, however, um, what we do is that we, if you spawn a VM, then we'll be moved in the, into the resource group of a pod. So not all VMs are running the, in one resource group, but rather are, are moved to pod resource groups. But we get into that into detail in a few slides. Um, all right. So we spoke about the runtime and um, that it's living in pods. Now the question is, and I said that the um, that other approaches put their runtimes alongside the kubelet. So we also considered that approach, but for now we said um, that's not so nice because we would need to put stuff on the host. But that's not the only integration point. We've got additional integration points. So for example, we said that we have a we need a separate API for our virtualization functionality. 
And I mentioned already that we, we were using CRDs and TPRs in the past. And that's actually the, the intended and blessed way of integrating with Kubernetes on the API level of using either CRDs today or custom API servers. The good thing here is that if you provide, if we do the integration on the API level, on the one hand, we can use all the tooling provided by Kubernetes to do that integration. On, on the other hand, we can actually use other Kubernetes objects. For example, I mean, in the API example I gave, they would reuse that persistent volume claim um, inside a VM to, to make that semantic connection between a VM and using a persistent volume claim as a backing door for virtual disks. So with all this knowledge, um, here's now a technical deep dive. And if there's a question, which I could imagine, please let me know. Um, but with these informations uh, we had so far, the architecture looks as follows. So on the left hand side in the clustering components, if you look at the white box, which is called API server, that is the API server of Kubernetes. Conceptually, we now run alongside of that our Vert API server. Today, it's because the API server aggregation is really fresh and we are still updating that part. It is a bit different than shown in the diagram, but it's really close to that. Then to add our virtualization capabilities to the whole cluster, we use a daemon set to deploy the Vert handlers and livered to every host in the cluster or to selected nodes. So here we can also use the namespace features or node selection features or in general tanks and tolerations or labels to assign um, our Qbert nodes to, to the real physical nodes as needed. The vert handler in the picture, which is uh, shown quite in the middle, is responsible for, for watching the VM API objects and then performing the necessary operations on the host, so speaking to libvirt to really launch the VM. And as you see, it's hinted here, the VM is then actually launched in the pod of the handler in libvirt, but rather the pod which is assigned to that VM that is important to do uh, because it allows libvirt, uh, sorry, it allows Kubernetes to track the resource consumptions of that specific VM um, and not all the resource usage of all VMs is aggregated in, in one pod. So we are basically doing everything inside pods and that also permits, though we need to see if it's feasible or not, to run other pods which just run container workloads alongside um, alongside Kubernetes. With that API server aggregation, which we saw on the left side on this side slide, so here, um, you can really now, oh, that allows us to really integrate also on the on the um, on the user level with the existing tools in Kubernetes. So kubectl will work for, for a pod like it will work for a VM. Um, because the API server will, will make sure that the um, requests related to virtualization will be redirected to, to our virtualization logic, to our virt controller, which was shown in the slide before. So I described it a little bit, and um, now I would go into a small example of how it really looks to illustrate what component is involved, where and how does the spawning process of a VM look? So this slide shows how the how the waiting state is. So nothing happened, no VMs are defined, um, and um, we want to move forward. Once a VM is getting created, currently that is a CRD, um, the Vert controller will see that actually, because the Vert controller is watching for VM instances or actually all kinds of virtualization objects which we introduced. Once that happens, the Vert controller will schedule a pod, the so-called VM pod. This pod will act as the harbor or the resource group for that VM. Once that pod is scheduled on a VM, uh, on a node, um, the Vert handler will see that the VM got scheduled and will tell libvirt to launch the VM inside that pod. From that moment on, Kubernetes is aware of the resource consumption of the VM and can do proper accounting. So we can even set limits on the pod, I mean, limits in the pod sense, uh, with regards to memory consumption and CPU limits to make sure that the VM really does not exceed uh, those limits. 
this cannot be done for one VM, but rather for all VMs. So the, pr the process here is pretty simple and straightforward. I'm just looking at the um, questions to see if we can answer something. So the question is, can the node in this case be by metal or virtual or only one of them? So it can be both, uh, but it depends. So primarily Kubernetes is intended for, for bare metal. Um, that's where we traditionally run virtualization workloads, but nesting is becoming more and more stable. I'm not sure if we will support that in production mode, but if you enable nesting um, on your physical node, then you can also run um, Kubert on virtual nodes. Oh, and besides of that, if you don't enable nesting, you can still run your VM in emulation mode. That has a serious performance impact, but it's still possible. The other question. Oh yeah, right, there was an answer. Very good. So, um, so that is effectively the launch process. Um, that's all happening in the Kubernetes cluster. There are no underlying components involved so far. There are, I grant, there are some things to consider on the low levels, um, which you cannot see here, um, so which are a bit nasty and to be solved, but the proof of concept works and we'll take a look at that. No, not only the proof of concept, but it's working reliably so far. We still have to do some research. That is rather the, the approach here. So technical gaps um, in general. We saw while well, well, starting, or since we started working in Kubert, we saw that a lot of functionality is there. Um, sadly, as often it's the case that the functionality is present in areas which we don't need that feature rich yet, and that areas which we require um, is lacking functionality. However, wherever we see gaps, a main intention of Kubert is not to work around them in our on our side, but rather to the Kubernetes community to see that we can fix those issues in Kubernetes, if it makes sense and if it's possible. Um, why? Because we want to strengthen and we want to improve the Kubernetes infrastructure. Like if we take core concepts like fencing, we could possibly work around them in, on our side on Kubert, but it makes so much more sense for, to put that into Kubernetes so that containers gain these benefits as well. So that is, that is one of the conceptual also reasons for Kubert that we want to strengthen the infrastructure of Kubernetes to also support our workload. If you're interested in the details, then we can take a, a quick look at all the gaps we encountered or at a selection of gaps we encountered so far. So resource protection, um, exclusiveness and fencing. Itama mentioned fencing. Exclusiveness is really that you can guarantee that only a single node or a single VM is accessing a volume at a given point in time. Currently, this is done on the on the scheduling level in Kubernetes, but that's not sufficient if you want to prevent that the database is getting corrupted. Host lifecycle management, which is strong, at least in Overt, and is also something which is not so good yet in Kubernetes. Kubeadmin and tools alike really improve the situation, but we're still seeing some gaps there. Device management, um, it's seeing some traction, especially because from the vGPU point of view, um, so there are some concepts pushed into Kubernetes to support device management and device path through into pods and thus hopefully also into VMs. Compute. For performance, we need to have CPU pinning and NUMA. Um, we're also seeing some advancements there. Um, it took quite a while for Kubernetes to, to find the right approach here, but it's really nice to see that they warmed up to it. Uh, dynamic SLA is effectively that we can modify the CPU and RAM limits in the pod sense, or that we can remove and add RAM and CPU for VMs. Um, that seems also to be happening, um, but it also takes its while until the concepts are ready in Kubernetes. And once they are, then we can piggyback that. I'm just checking the questions. So in the sense of multi-Kubernetes clusters with federation, Yes, we need to see how that works. Uh, I'm currently not aware how that works with um, the custom API servers in general, but we are aligning to, to what Kubernetes expects, uh, how, how integration should look. And so we hope that Kubernetes also provides a way of, of how this can look in the, in the broader Kubernetes ecosystem, including federation. Um, 
how's networking handled between containers and VMs within the same project? Right, so that's actually, uh, uh, what a coincidence. So it's actually the next point on the detailed gap. So currently, or work in progress, and it will land within the next two weeks probably, is that we, um, our first, um, no, it took us a while to find the right approach. So our first approach will be that we obey the networking of Kubernetes. So what we do is we request new interfaces from Kubernetes um, to be assigned to a pod. Um, this is actually in line with what is happening in Kubernetes. So pods will get multi-network or multi-interface support, and we will be reusing that. Um, so additional interfaces will be used first to um, be assigned to VMs. Um, that is pretty straightforward, but then we need to make sure to align with Kubernetes that um, we give that the VMs are respecting the IP addresses. We hope that this will work out with CNI. So we're doing that on the CNI level. And we effectively request new interfaces from CNI to be attached to VMs. Um, this is under heavy research and we are prototyping this kind of stuff. We are in contact with the CNI or with several CNI people there to see what the right approach is. On the long run, however, we want to see that we get layer two networking. But that is conceptually difficult because layer two networking Kubernetes is not there yet. And it has not been discussed so far. And the question really is um, if it makes sense for Kubernetes. Um, so it's a research, research area which we need to, to tackle. For storage, we identified that the kubelet does well at setting up storage, but for advanced production ready configurations of multipathing, for example, that's still a, a way to go there to support that for every connection, for, for every volume type it supports. Advanced operations like cloning of snapshots, especially on the on the server side, is also something. Snapshotting has been designed, cloning. I've not seen any proposal for that yet, but that is stuff we need for the VMs. Scheduling, resource driven. So um, this is actually also emerging since we created that slide deck. Uh, resource aware scheduling will make it into Kubernetes. The first proposals are in related to device plugins. But we also need to do the scheduling based on custom metrics. So, so far, Kubernetes is using the pod metrics to do the appropriate scheduling. We need to enhance Kubernetes or provide our feedback to make sure that we can also use virtualization metrics to do the scheduling. Rescheduling or balancing is to make sure that the um, that pods today, pods are only scheduled once they are created. But to apply policies to a cluster, for example, for power saving, as Itamar mentioned before, you want to do rescheduling or ban balancing. So after pod creation time, you might want to move a pod or a VM in our case to a different node to be able to shut down some nodes to save power. I'm skipping the modularity. On the infrastructure side, we also obviously need some, we need some enhancements to make it really to allow us to extend Kubernetes to provide the virtualization workload. So we want to extend kubectl to to be able to add verbs like live migration or starting and stopping of VMs, which is not present in the pod concepts. And we need the EN add on formalization to make sure that we really um, are on the same page when it comes to integration between Kubernetes and, and, um, and Kubert. And then there's the UAS native object storage in Kubernetes, which effectively allows us to, to really, now that we have our use API server to, to store our objects still in Kubernetes and not need to provide our own key value store to store our, our data. This got very detailed, I noticed, but um, I hope it gives an insight into what gaps there are and what we are looking into to solve. So a quick wrap up before we get to a small demo. So on the API level, um, we really, we're investigating. So we started with a libert like API um, including scheduling aspects, um, but we still want to see and want to get a feeling for what granularity do we want? Do we want to be more pod-like, which was very simple at the beginning, actually, and this has now grown more sophisticated with all the enhancements like, um, um, for example, advanced selectors, taints and tolerations, it's adding more complexity to pod specs, but we want to see if we want to stay complex or become more simple. We also need to rethink, or not rethink, but continuously think and revisit if how how the low-level mechanics, what I mentioned in, initially, 
Doing the implementation on the CRI level has benefits and drawbacks, and we want to keep revisiting that process because we need to evaluate that for every single feature we have and how it matches together. Um, it's ongoing research, and often you just get to the questions once you, once you get to the implementation. We noticed that Kubernetes still has, has the gaps. We just mentioned them, and we need to see that we, we get the right ones delivered in time so that we can make progress and, and are not blocked, because otherwise we are pushed to do workarounds. And that is, is, is taking time and doesn't drive Kubernetes in the right direction. A nice side note is that the operator pattern wor works pretty nice. That is the pattern we use um, to track the VMs and was actually defined by CoreOS. In the end, um, we want to say that we need to continue um, with our research. Um, we see um, that, that there is potential for convergence um, and it looks promising. Like one nice side effect, which is implicit, is that it's so convenient that you just take a cluster, or like we will see in a minute, you take Minikube and just have to deploy pods on it and you get um, a VM runtime for free. And you can use the same infrastructure. And that is really, really convenient. The separation so far also looks like a win-win because Kubernetes can drive in its own pace focused on the container workloads. And we on the Kubert side can look um, and that we drive in our pace and, and just see that we align on the, on the integration points. In general, it also looks like a win-win because we can, which goes into the direction of the previous point because we can align on the same infrastructure. There are tension points. Um, what we need to see, what we need to, to see, what route do we take? Do we drive for the absolute feature parity and, and even violate some Kubernetes assumptions? Or do we rather say we limit that feature, but gain that we are more behaving like Kubernetes would expect it or how Kubernetes is, is setting expectations? Like for, for NUMA. For NUMA, we know we need to do a lot of detailed work to get it the real performance out of it. And we are not so sure if Kubernetes will go the whole way. So that is an area where we need to see where, where do we end up with or what do we end up with? Where, where do we want to put the focus on? Full functionality or better integration? And finally, if you're seeing a lot of stuff is easy, but really coming with stable and production enterprise uh, ready, uh, solutions is hard, and we see that every day. After these, after this small summary, um, and now it's um, close to the end, um, I would still try to give you a small demo to, to show um, how this is actually working. And um, after the slide deck has been shared, you can also try it yourself at home. Uh, the demo um, which we've prepared um, is based on Minikube or is, is lever leveraging Minikube. And um, it will effectively deploy Kubert on Minikube and we'll be able to run a VM and um, connect to it, hopefully. Before that, I'm taking a look at the questions, but there seem no further questions. I think you're doing a pretty good job um, so far answering the questions in, in line. So yeah, let's, let's see the demo and then we'll take more questions afterwards. Very well. So. Here I've checked out the demo repository, which is shown in the slides. Um, to start, you, you run the demo.sh script, um, which is effectively just checking if you've got kubectl installed, if you've got minikube installed, and then it's checking out kubert uh, from GitHub. After it checked out kubert, uh, then it's deploying manifests, including a test VM. Um, once that happened, and you know, Deploying a manifest is one thing, but then it takes a while until all the container images are downloaded. Um, and that is what is ha happening in this line. Um, the, now we're waiting that the containers are downloaded. And if you do it for the first time, really, it can take a few minutes until all images are downloaded. Um, there's a lot of debugging stuff added. It's not optimized for size yet, so it can really take some time at the moment. But once that is done, um, you can really see that um, a VM is eventually running. And yes, we do see it here. So the VM is running. And here, by the way, 
you see the output is not very sophisticated. So that is where we want to improve kubectl to allow custom rendering for custom objects, VMs in our case. To get some more details, uh, we can do, use the JSON output. And here we see already the VM definition. Here in the domain part, uh, we see that a console is defined in a disk, um, that an iSCSI target is used as a backing source for, for the disk, and this should actually be updated to, to use a persistent volume claim to highlight that more. And we see that a graphics device is attached, including a network device. Further above, just to show that, it all really looks like, like a regular, regular Kubernetes uh, object. You've got labels, you've got some metadata annotations. Um, so it's really something you can use with your existing tools. To see, um, so we know that the VM is running. What we can do now is um, we can take a look at the pods. Um, and here, that should roughly match with what you've seen in the architecture diagram. So we've got the HA proxy, which is just an artifact because we don't have API server aggregation yet. We've got an iSCSI demo target, which is providing the image for the VM. We've got Libert running a dedicated pod. Uh, we've got a SPICE proxy, uh, which is sitting on the border of the cluster to, to allow accessing the VM. We've got the VERT API, which is providing the custom resources, or currently it's providing the validation of the custom resources. We've got a VERT controller, which is reacting to, to the created API objects, so VM in this case. We've got a vert handler, which is running on the node and speaking to libvirt. And we've got the vert launcher. That is the pod VM, which is opening the resource group for the VM. And we've got a vert manifest, which is an artifact of the work in progress we currently have. If we now do, um, if we now look into um, the libvirt pod, um, we should be able to see that the test VM is really running. But that's not what we want. We don't want to directly go to the pod, but we, and we don't want to go to the pod to then see that the VM is running. What we rather want to do is we want to connect um, to the VM itself if possible. So what we can do is there's a small binary utility which we provide. It will become a kube CTL plugin at some point, once that is standardized and looks it is now. Um, vert CTL um allows us to connect to the console and actually also to spice so what we will do is we'll connect to the serial console first we need to provide the um uh, the right ip to connect to of the api server and it's listening on a specific port um, then we need to name the dvm and the device to use um, all right just a second I probably used the wrong port. Oh yeah, there you see. I had a mix up in the port number. So, and here we go. It seems we're logged in. So, and here we are running in Alpine Linux. And that is actually the disk um, which is provided by the demo target. We can do stuff like rebooting, um, so it's really a connection through Vert CTL, which is actually in the background, the, the implementation is similar to the exec call of the kubectl command. So here we really try to, to play along with how, um, how Kubernetes is doing it. The serial console is not the only thing. What we can also do is we can do spies. We take the same line. Oh, yes. Oh. Oh, it's, it's not. Oh, yeah, I shut it down. So what we do now is we kubectl um, So I deleted the test VM, and now I'm pre recreating it. Import temp kuber demo kuber manifest on our cluster. VM YAML. A VM is created, and now we should be able to, to display the spice button. And here we go. And we see that the VM is running. It's a bit slow um, because as the question was, this is running in emulation mode. Um, we can actually change that. Up, up to recently, Minikube did not allow doing nesting. I think it landed in the last version of Minikube, so it should be faster in future. 
So, and that was the demo. Um, are there any questions what you show in that demo? I cannot show live migration uh, because it's just a single node, but it's sufficient to, to play around with other stuff. If there aren't any questions. Um, I, I have, um, maybe it's a, a newbie question. The, the issues you were talking about with NUMA, um, the, the memory access bottlenecks and stuff, is, is that anything that, um, yeah, I know that's important to all the, the, the VM and virtual machines um, folks out there, but is that anything that gets solved by Kubernetes, um, that bottlenecks? I know it's, you keep talking about it being very, very important to solve that, but just yeah. wondering. So open, oh, yeah, so sorry for interrupting. The delay is horrible. Um, so OpenShift is taking a lead here. So what Kubernetes says, and that's also, by the way, an argument for putting VMs in, uh, in VMs into pods is, Kubernetes says we want to support any workload. And there's that area of performance sensitive workloads and which OpenShift is seeing a demand for. And um, so some people from, from the OpenShift team, like Jeremy Ida, um, is looking into that area. And um, they actually tried for three quarters of a year to, to make Kubernetes aware of these important tuning on the low levels. The problem is that the Kubernetes stakeholders said for a long time that is too fine granular. Um, we, we cannot solve that on the API level be because we don't want to, to mess up the API with all those low level details. So after an iterative process of like six or seven PRs or proposals of how to solve the problem, they finally settled down and found something. So today it looks like they um, will be implementing an approach where you can um, where you can specify a policy of how your processes shall be distributed among NUMA nodes, and which is a compromise. Um, mm -hmm. So back to your question. Yes, we do see that they're opening up to it. It just takes time, and um, especially in areas which have not been important to Kubernetes before, it really takes its time until um, the use case is understood and until the right solution is found. It really can take a little bit of back and forth. So if people want to get involved in this project, um, where where on GitHub can they find you? Where can they find you and, and do this? There we go. That's what I wanted to see. Yeah. Thank you very much. So first, thank all of you for listening. Um, and yes, um, we are really looking for, for people trying out Qbird and trying it and filing issues. Um, also from other distributions so far, we are trying it on CentOS and, and Fedora, but we would really like to see that it runs on other distributions like Debian, CoreOS as well. There should not be, it should not be so difficult because we are, our, our platform is the cluster, not the host. So it should be fairly easy, but that is what we really would love to see contributions. But you're also welcome to contribute to code, doing testing, or just use it. So um, join us. Um, on GitHub at Qbird, we don't have a Slack channel yet, um, but we're on Freenode as well on IRC, good old IRC and the Qbird channel on, on the Freenode network. So there, there is one more question that uh, Marcello is asking: is how can I look the logs between look at the logs between VM orchestration and Kubernetes cluster in a Kubernetes space? They have fluent D pod to catch all the logs. What do you do? I guess is the basic question. So um, but that's a good question. So what you can do is, um, so we try to integrate nicely here. So we provide the logs from the pods. So if you are interested in what the controller did to schedule the node, um, then you can really take a look. I'm doing it uh, now. You can take a look like with any other component, like with any other pod at the logs um, of, of the relevant component. Um, you want to you want to debug. So we are emitting events. Actually, we are emitting VM events on on the cluster for state changes, um, and we try to emit um, valuable logs for every component. So you can debug it on the node level as well. Um, so you can say kubectl of get pods to get the right. So if you want to debug the node level for a specific node because you know that a specific node had issues, then you can take the handler and uh, take a look at them there. And the same is true for for Libbird. There you get all the Libbird uh, debug output. So it's it's fairly straightforward. Okay.
like I, I think my mind is a little bit blown because it's like I always with Kubernetes, as, as everyone knows, we always associate everything with containers. And this is, you know, a huge leap forward. And I've talked with the Claire Containers folks a bit, too, in the past. And this is just, you know, the merging of two great technologies in one um, one cluster management approach. So I, I think this is just pretty um, useful stuff. Is this, um, it, you know, pardon, I'm at Red Hat and I, I, I'm asking this question and it's an external facing thing, but is this mostly um, Red Hatters working on Kubert at the moment um, or are there other folks from the Kubernetes world working with you guys? Um, so we, it emerged from Red Hat because we did not see that, that these needs were yeah. addressed elsewhere. What we're seeing now is, so first, um, we also, we, we see participation from OpenStack, which is nice. So we're classically from, from the overt side, but um, OpenStack also has its interest in it. And um, we also see that users come from different distributions. So we especially see that um, bugs are filed by users from the outside, but the development is so far is, yeah, is a Reddit, but I would really love to see that we see more contributions from, from others. Yeah. So one one of the other things, um, the on the Kubernetes community meetings, um, have you done one of their um, like the the intro of every? I think it starts in three minutes. Is the next one? Um, mm -hmm. They have little t demo times where you can demo your new stuff. Have you done one of those yet? Oh, we we are. We want to. Um, the Let's demo I just showed is really hot. It was effective. It's just possible to do that since last week. Um, uh -huh. So it's really, yeah. So we, there was to demo it before was really cumbersome. So doing the demo with Minikube really is a leap forward for us because we can now easily show it, and that's actually the opportunity that we want to step up to. You know, other forums to to show what you can do. All right, well, let's get you on there because that'll get you a lot of eyeballs from around the Kubernetes world too. So um, this is great work. Thank you, Itmar and Fabian for doing this today. Um, uh, you know, from the audience, it's a really good question. So thank you for coming in and asking them. Um, and we'll have you on again in the next iteration too. And um, hopefully we can get you to, to show it with Minishift or maybe even OpenShift Live um, at some point too. That would be awesome um, not to put you on the spot. But um, that would be really, really cool. And this is, you know, it, very interesting to me because I think all this mixed um, workloads is definitely something people are looking for, um, as it's uh, obvious from the audience uh, that we gathered here today. So hopefully we can get you some feedback and more, more eyeballs and more resources working with you on the project. So thanks again for coming, and um, we'll talk to you all soon.